I was afraid. I didn't know where I was. Lost and disoriented, a strange crowd makes its way through a wooded suburb. Just minutes ago, they were aboard a flight bound for Portland, Oregon. All of a sudden, there was a big crash. The next thing I knew, I was standing outside. I don't know how the hell I got there. A man with a flashlight Excuse me. came down the aisle. And they continued circling for about an hour. Was it a crew problem, or was it an aircraft problem? The voice recorder okay, let's go. could provide the answer. I'll reset that circuit breaker momentarily. I was very interested in how a highly experienced captain could fly around from the side of the airport in good weather and not put this airplane on the ground safely. OK, declare May Day. May Day, May Day. December the 28th, 1978. We're losing an engine. United Airlines Flight 173 is less than 35 kilometers from Portland International Airport. It's flamed out. What? You can fly a DC-8 or any transport airplane with one engine inoperative. John Cox is a commercial pilot and aviation expert. Requires a lot of airmanship. Pilots train every time they're in a simulator in case of a loss of an engine. All right. The thing to remember is don't worry. Captain Malburn McBroom, a veteran of the Second World War, is one of United Airlines' most experienced pilots. His first officer, Rod Beebe, has more than 5,000 hours flying experience. The first officer was relatively new on the airplane. He had probably been on it six months or maybe less. He was an experienced pilot, but he'd been flying other equipment. Flight engineer Forrest Mendenhall is the third member of the crew. OK. It's his job to monitor the DC-8's three remaining engines. The flight began in New York City with a stopover in Denver. It's three days after Christmas. Many of the 189 people on board are returning from their holidays. 17-year-old Amy Connor is flying back to boarding school in Washington State. I picked up the flight in Denver, and uh, everything seemed to go normally. I got to my seat. I was sitting in between two very nice people. In the cockpit, All right. the pilots are focused on getting their plane to the airport. United 173 would like clearance on approach at 28 left now. Air traffic controller Ed Kingray is on duty at Portland Tower. I was working radar that night down in the radar room. But as I recall, it wasn't uh, all that busy at the time. United 173 heavy. OK, roll out heading 010 to runway 28 left. He clears flight 173 to land on the airport's longest runway. He said, we'll, we'll be heading in for a landing now. In this case, he was coming from the east, so he lined him up for a straight in. You're going to lose number three in a minute, too. The plane's engines are flaming out, one after another. I recall hearing the captain tell the tower the losing engines. With two engines gone, the autopilot can no longer fly the plane. McBrew must get the crippled DC-8 to the airport himself. Gotta keep running, Frosty. Yes, sir. The engineer struggles to keep the last two engines running. How far do you show us from the field? I'd call it, uh... I told him it's 18, 18 flying, flying miles, which would include the base leg uh, to the final and then the turn to final to the end of the runway. We just lost one and two. Flight 173 has now lost all four engines. The cabin lights all went out. That, we all assumed, was an indicator that something was wrong. With no engines running, 
backup batteries now provide power to only critical instruments. People started to shout. Brace! Brace! Get your heads down, get into your brace positions. Brace! The 100-ton aircraft is losing more than 3,000 feet of altitude a minute. Total power loss in a DC-8 would be very catastrophic. At this rate, they will be lucky to stay airborne for as long as 90 seconds. Now Captain McBroom makes a horrifying calculation. We can't make it. The airport is too far away. Can't make anything. The jetliner is dropping fast over a city of 350,000 people. McBroom needs to find a safe place to put the aircraft down and try to save the lives of all on board. To land a transport jet off an airport is a situation that no pilot wants to face. Putting it into a populated area would be an absolute last choice. OK, declare a mayday. Portland Tower, United 173, heavy mayday. He declared mayday, and then in a very, what seemed to me like a, a calm, matter-of-fact voice, I could hear the pilot. The engines are flaming out. We're going down. We're not going to be able to make it to the airport. We lost power. We're going down. Emergency services are told what's happening. Flight 173 is flamed out. They're going down. King Ray tries to figure out where they'll hit. I could see him coming in from the south, his navigational lights flashing. I could tell he was quite low. The DC-8 is coming down over a densely populated suburb. And I can no longer see him. I was, of course, expecting the worst. Suddenly, Captain McBroom sees what he's been looking for. A dark area up ahead. It looks like an empty field. The place that you want to put it is where there, there's minimum buildings, uh, the most open area possible, because the 200,000 pounds plus jet arriving at 140 knots, which is 160 plus miles an hour, it's going to do a lot of damage to the things on the ground. Putting the plane on this narrow strip of land is McBroom's best bet. But as he gets closer, he realizes it isn't an open field. We can't make it. It's a heavily wooded suburb, and he's headed straight for it. If they're woods and that's all you have, then you're going to have to deal with it. The tops of trees are pretty soft. As you settle into the trees, they get progressively less soft. They're going to do a lot of damage. McBroom doesn't give up. He actually tries to steer the plane between the trees. The passengers still assume they're about to touch down on a runway. We clipped the top of a few trees, and that felt like we were making the initial landing at the airport. So my first sense was, you know, hooray, we're there. And then all hell broke loose. It was this enormous noise. I can't even begin to describe what kind of noise it is. It's physical. You can feel it in your bones. I saw the bright flash out there and, uh, and knew he had gone down. The plane carves a 500-meter-long path through the trees. After the plane stopped moving, um, it was pretty calm. There was no fire. People just wanted to get out and very polite, taking turns. There was no hurry. I remember seeing a lot of people with the same expression of stunned disbelief. You know, where are we and how did we get here? Incredibly, the DC-8 has crash-landed in the middle of a major American city without injuring a single person on the ground. Most of the 189 passengers and crew are alive. 
including Captain Malvin McBroom. The captain flying the airplane, he kept it under control, and that's a big, big, big positive. <laughs> but he can't understand why his plane lost power and crashed. I was afraid. I didn't know where I was. I was only 17. I also realized that my parents in Minnesota needed to hear from me. I walked into this home. Hello? And I said, I need to use your telephone. My parents' initial reaction was to um, listen and kind of blow me off. I was a teenage drama queen, and 17-year-olds um, do tend to exaggerate. But a few minutes later, they got the news. They broke into their television program. The plane crashed five miles southeast of the airport in a residential area. Two homes were hit. One disintegrated. Rescue workers worked through the night. They carefully picked through the wreckage looking for bodies. They won't know the exact number of dead until sometime today. The news teams found us before the emergency crews did. And so there was cameras, there was lights. Next thing I know, it was boom, boom, real hard. And we were shaking and we were down in a position. All of a sudden, there was a big, you know, a big crash. One thump, I remember, and then I, the next thing I knew, I was standing outside. I don't know how the hell I got there. Confronted by such an unprecedented disaster, the entire airline industry needs an answer. How could a DC-8 crash 10 kilometers short of the airport on a calm, clear night? The morning after the crash of United Airlines Flight 173, NTSB investigators are on the scene. One of the members of the team is human factors specialist, Alan Deal. We needed to get out and document the wreckage, take photographs, take measurements, and so on. It's very critical that you do that. It's apparent to Deal that this disaster could have been much worse. How the hell did they miss those? Captain McBroom somehow managed to shoehorn the plane into a narrow strip of woods in the middle of Portland. When I saw how close he'd come to apartment complexes, I realized this could be have been one of the worst accidents in history. The main cabin of Flight 173 has survived the crash largely intact. But the nose of the plane is completely destroyed. It looked to me like the front of the airplane almost opened up like a banana when it plowed through the woods. And couldn't believe that anybody had survived this. Eight passengers and two members of the crew are dead. The flight engineer had died in the crash, as had the lead flight attendant. Investigators hope survivors can provide some insight into what brought this jet down. When did you first notice something out of the ordinary? Um. They learned that just over an hour before the crash, the passengers heard a terrifying sound. We heard a loud thud and felt the plane jolt. The whole plane just shook. It was, a, it was a jarring sensation. What was that? And of course, everybody wanted to know what it was. What was that? The lots of conversation starters. What do you think that was? Lots of guessing. A man with a flashlight came down the aisle. One of the pilots comes back to the passenger cabin. At this point, I started realizing something really was wrong. Excuse me, I'll look out the window here. That something wasn't working the way it should be, and they weren't telling us about it yet. The pilot is searching for something in the darkness. We're all wanting to know what was going on. Then the captain came on the PA. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. The pilot finally got on and said, we're having trouble with the landing gear. We're not sure whether or not it's working correctly. We'll be running a few routine checks. Captains are always focused on the safety of the passengers. It comes with the job. 
That is, if the airplane is experiencing an abnormality, what's the effect on the passengers and crew? Do we need to descend? What do we need to do to make sure that everybody gets through this abnormality with the minimum negative effects? How did the uh, cabin crew react? They told us to prepare for an emergency landing. Passengers are told to remove their jewelry and securely stow any loose items. It's clear the captain is concerned that his landing gear might collapse on touchdown. But something isn't making sense to deal. Crash landings on airport are, are eminently survivable. First of all, you've got all the equipment to handle the fire, the fire engines and the rescue people. But if you have to go off airport, it's a whole different uh, situation. How does a landing gear problem bring down a plane? At the crash site of United Airlines Flight 173, investigators retrieve the plane's flight recorders. One contains flight data. The other records voices in the cockpit. I've always said that the flight data recorder tells you what happened. But you have to listen very carefully to the cockpit voice recorder to understand why things happened the way they did. The recorders will be analyzed at National Transportation Safety Board headquarters in Washington. One of the most important witnesses is Ed Kingray, the controller who handled Flight 173's approach. I cleared him for an approach to runway 28. I was about to hand him off to the tower controller. He basically said he'd stay with me. Uh, that he was having some kind of uh, unsafe gear indication, and he didn't know if one of the uh, landing gear were down. Uh, negative, we'll stay with you. We've got a gear problem, we'll let you know. Flight 173 did not want to come in to land. United 173 heavy, turn left heading 100. I'll just orbit you out there. King Ray cleared Flight 173 to fly a holding pattern south of the airport over the Portland suburbs. Captain McBroom wanted time to troubleshoot the gear problem and give his flight attendants time to prepare the cabin for an emergency landing. If they have opportunity to plan and prepare people, things such as where the exits are, the quality and success of the evacuation goes up dramatically. A holding pattern would basically give him his own airspace there to do whatever he had to do. I didn't hear much from him after that. Investigators learn that after they begin circling, King Ray only speaks to Flight 173 to warn them of other nearby aircraft. I would give him traffic and he would acknowledge it. Uh, there's traffic out there about 9.30. I see somebody out there with a light on. But no indication to me what was going on inside the cockpit. The crew of Flight 173 is given as much time as it needs in the holding pattern. It's up to the captain to decide when it's time for them to come in and land. Well, they continued circling for about an hour. Investigators learn Flight 173 circled Portland for an unusually long time. There was no indication to me uh, the gravity of the situation. They now wonder what happened during that hour of circling to turn a landing gear malfunction. We've got a gear problem. We'll let you know. Into catastrophic engine failure. The engines are flaming out. We're going down. We're not going to be able to make it to the airport. I was uh, clearly very interested in, you know, how a highly experienced captain could uh, fly around for over an hour in sight of the airport in good weather and not uh, put this airplane on the ground safely. Investigators find the plane's right side landing gear. A rusty bolt has pulled free of the mechanism that raises and lowers the gear. This could explain it. The landing gear would have dropped suddenly into place. 
the free fall of the gear would be very apparent to everyone on the airplane. What was that? You would get a very large thump or clunking sound. You'd feel the gear slam up against the lock, and so you'd get this reverberation through the airplane. And we learned that due to corrosion, the extension mechanism had failed, and that's what caused the gear to slam down. The discovery explains the troubling sound heard in the cabin an hour before the crash. But it doesn't explain why the DC-8 lost engine power while circling over Portland. Investigator Dennis Grossi joins the effort to find out. I was uh, assigned to be the aircraft performance engineer for this accident. Basically, it's pulling together all the information uh, that's available to determine the aircraft's performance. If there was a malfunction, Grossi hopes the cockpit voice recorder picked up the pilots discussing it. OK, let's go. The recording begins 30 minutes before the crash as the pilots circle over Portland. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. In the era of analog recording, the CVR uses a 30-minute long loop of magnetic tape that keeps recording over itself throughout the flight. Most air disasters unfold in a matter of minutes or even seconds. So having the last half hour of cockpit sounds and conversation should give investigators enough material to work with. There's four channels, one cockpit area microphone, and then a channel for each of the three crew members. Because I only got this thing to shine down there. They hear the flight engineer leave the cockpit to troubleshoot the landing gear problem. In the early generation jets, it was very common to have mechanical indications that the landing gear was, in fact, down and locked. When the landing gear is lowered, a small rod pops up on the wing, providing visual confirmation that the gear is in place. The flight engineer would be asked by the captain to go back and check the mechanical indicators for the position of the landing gear. He'd walk down the aisle to about the center of the wing. Excuse me, I'll look out the window here. And he could look over, and there are tabs that actually come up and go down. And he could see if the gear was extended and locked. It's exactly what Amy Connor described to investigators. A man with a flashlight came through the aisle. In her post-crash interview. How's that main gear back there? Uh, both appear to be down and locked. Despite his engineer's report, Captain McBroom is still concerned. If the gear is locked, none of the lights should be flashing. And the touchdown of that gear folds or something. Obviously, the lights were affected, the, the electronics that uh, tell the crew members whether or not the gear is down and locked. Landing gear failure is rare in commercial aviation. When it does happen, statistics show that most passengers survive unscathed. In 2008, engine failure forced British Airways Flight 38 to make a crash landing. The impact ripped the Boeing 777's landing gear from the fuselage. The plane was a write-off, but no one was killed. There's one check we missed. Checking the gear warning horn. Uh, right. 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 Normally, when we see these problems of a gear light not coming on, it's a light bulb or some minor piece of circuitry. It appears that a minor electrical problem had become a major distraction for Captain McBrew. So how do we do that? That still doesn't explain why the plane lost power. But what investigators hear next could explain everything. Losing an engine, it's flamed out. Why? Fuel. First Officer Beebe's answer is chilling. After nearly an hour in a holding pattern, Flight 173 is simply running out of gas. We're 
losing an engine. The voice recorder from Flight 173 has revealed a disturbing situation. It's flamed out. What? Less than eight minutes before the DC-8 crashes into a Portland suburb, the captain is unaware that his plane has run low on fuel. He was asking what was causing that, and he got a, a very adamant answer saying, fuel. Fuel. As if to say, we've been trying to tell you about this all along. Hope it goes crossfeeds here or something. There are crossfeed valves that are opened in a specific sequence to let one tank feed one or more engines. And it's the job of the flight engineer, in the case of a DC-8, to know exactly how to do that. Showing fumes. Though the crew couldn't agree on exactly how much was left. Oh, showing a 1,000 or better. I don't think it's in there. One thing is certain. There isn't enough to keep the engines running. Losing an engine. It's flamed out. It takes a few things for, to make an engine run. One of them is fuel. You got that cross feed open? Captain McBroom is desperate. He needs to get more fuel to the remaining engines. No, I haven't got it open. Which one? Uh, open them both. Damn it, get some fuel in there. Each of the plane's four engines has its own fuel tank. Opening the cross feeds should allow fuel to flow between the four main tanks. Number two is empty. But it's not working. You're going to lose number three in a minute, too. One by one, fuel starvation shuts down all the engines, leaving the DC-8 without any power. OK, declare a mayday. The engines didn't have any fuel. We knew that the aircraft ran out of fuel. So then became the question, why? Why would a uh, modern transport aircraft like this run out of fuel? Investigators focus on two possibilities, mechanical failure or human error. Was it a crew problem or was it an aircraft problem? McBroom may be the only one who can give the answer. I wanted to be on final with as much fuel as I could have. You gotta keep him running, Frosty. Recovering from his injuries in an Oregon hospital, he's now well enough to tell his side of the story. We finally sat down with Captain McBroom and uh, asked the tough questions. A pilot takes the responsibility for the passengers and his fellow crew members extremely seriously. And to be involved in an accident where there are fatalities is something that never leaves you. It would be with uh, a pilot the remainder of their lives. I recall seeing the number one and number two warning lights come on, but I, I knew we had fuel. He was still convinced that somehow the fuel had either leaked out of the tanks or the fuel burn was too high or the gauges were wrong. Oh, showing a 1,000 or better. I don't think it's in there. Meanwhile, in Washington, Dennis Grossi digs deeper in search of a mechanical cause. He studies Flight 173's flight plan. He uses it to calculate the amount of fuel the DC-8 should have burned. A DC-8 burns somewhere in the neighborhood of 13,000 pounds of fuel an hour. The question is, did this aircraft burn fuel faster than normal? If the data shows any discrepancy, it could mean the captain was right. The engines were using too much fuel. There must have been a problem that the engines were burning a lot more fuel than normal, or there was some anomaly in the aircraft. His analysis finds no problem. Flight 173 took off with more than enough fuel to reach Portland and was consuming it at the standard rate. Fuel burn is completely normal. The conclusion was that the aircraft performance was normal, and that there was no anomalies in the amount of fuel consumed. Showing fumes. 
Investigators are left with a troubling question. How could an experienced crew lose track of how much fuel they had on board and, in fact, run out of fuel when they were in view of the airport? Grossi considers the possibility that the plane's fuel gauges malfunctioned. He studies the CVR transcript, focusing in on the crew's discussion of fuel levels. Fuel gauges are not known for being all that precise. That's why it was so important for the performance study to correlate the amount of fuel that was actually on the aircraft with what was actually being indicated to the crew. How much fuel we got, Frost? If the gauges weren't working properly, 5,000. It could explain why the crew let the fuel levels fall so low. The crew discussed how much fuel they have. We had 5,000 pounds. By matching the time on the transcript with the fuel burn chart, Grossi can determine if the gauges were working accurately. You take the data and apply the time factor to it, and you can figure out how much fuel they should have had remaining. He discovers the flight engineer 5,000. had the correct reading. 5,000. That's exactly right. There was nothing wrong with the gauges. He said that they saw 5,000 pounds. That was consistent with what the fuel burn study showed. Investigators are convinced that Flight 173's fuel system was working exactly as it should. Lights in the fuel pump. 35 minutes after the captain put his plane into a holding pattern, a warning light tells the flight engineer that fuel is dangerously low. That's about right. The feed pumps are starting to blink. Fuel pump lights come on. This means that the they're literally sucking air. The, as the fuel sloshes around in the tanks, this plane should have been headed for the airport soon. But Captain McBroom still isn't ready to land. To be in an airplane with that little fuel, it's something I, that, as a pilot, I, I've never been in that position, and I would be extraordinarily uncomfortable. His reaction is puzzling. Figure about another 15 minutes. The flight engineer said, Captain, 15 minutes? That's going to run us kind of close on fuel out here. Not enough. 15 minutes is really going to run us low on fuel here. That was his one definitive statement to the captain that things were not right. The captain wants more time to prepare for the emergency landing. Call around. Give him our passenger count. Tell him to give that to the fire department. Instead of heading straight for the runway, he turns the plane into one last circle over Portland. I kept thinking, why isn't this guy turning into the airport at this time? The plane has been in a holding pattern for more than 40 minutes. It will take at least 15 more to land. But the aircraft has only 40 minutes worth of fuel. A crash landing is now inevitable. The engines are flaming out. We're going down. We're not going to be able to make it to the airport. Investigators now know that Captain McBroom received clear warnings about low fuel levels. This didn't have to happen. What they don't understand is why he ignored them. This was not an act of God. This was not a massive mechanical failure. This was an airplane that was perfectly flyable, good night, uh, within sight of the airport. This accident should never have happened. How much fuel you got now? The NTSB's Al Deal returns to the CVR, looking for anything that might shed some light on the captain's state of mind. When you listen to the tapes over and over again, you can detect things like voice inflections, subtle voice mannerisms that are trying to communicate uh, to other members of the crew. Deal is struck by an unusual aspect of McBroom's behavior in the cockpit. How much fuel you got now? His crewmates tried more than once to alert him to the fuel situation. How much fuel we got now? Four. Four. A thousand in each pound. Both the first officer and the second officer were acutely aware of the fuel status. 
but McBroom is focusing on the broken landing gear. You know, there's, there's one check we missed. Checking the gear warning horn. Uh, right. 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 So how do we do that? Flying with a very senior captain, it would be very difficult to, to challenge that captain in those days uh, about something like fuel. The other crew members were trying to get this captain's attention, but he was apparently totally focused on the gear problem to the exclusion of all else. Even after the engines begin to flame out, McBroom is still trying to fix the malfunctioning landing gear. McBroom was not going to give up. He was going to find the, what we sometimes call the golden BB, the one thing that would answer the riddle as to why this light is not on. And of course, that never happened. McBroom is determined to fix a mechanical problem that could threaten the plane's safety. On the touchdown, if that gear folds or something. As a result, he misses a far bigger and deadlier threat. The gear problem is really a distraction for the crew. You had a, a small problem with a small potential consequence, gear collapsing on landing. But the captain was so focused on that, he lost the big picture. Uh, reset that circuit breaker momentarily. See if we get gear lights. They lost sight of the real emergency, which was the lack of fuel. Al Deal now understands how Captain McBroom's obsession with the malfunctioning landing gear led to disaster. After this accident, the National Transportation Safety Board said flight crew members need to be better trained to communicate when they have safety of flight issues. What happened aboard Flight 173 is, alarmingly, not an isolated case. Just a year earlier, another DC-8 crashed in almost identical circumstances. It was a United crew, same kind of aircraft, gear on safe light, entered a holding pattern at night, flew around, troubleshooting the gear problem. They flew into a mountain and killed everybody aboard. It was one of a string of deadly crashes during the 1970s involving a lack of communication. The list includes Eastern Airlines Flight 401, a Lockheed L-1011 bound for Miami. Here, too, they had a gear and safe light. They ended up descending into the Everglades, crashing and killed over 100 people. The deadliest air disaster in history at Tenerife in the Canary Islands. It was caused by poor communication. The collision claimed 583 lives. There was a pattern here where we're having the same types of accidents, where other flight deck crew members were having a difficult time getting the captain's attention and making him do the right thing. Al Deal is convinced that the way pilots communicate with each other is now a growing threat to commercial aviation. A lot of people at NTSB and elsewhere thought we were going to be headed for a bloodbath if we didn't get a handle on the causes of human error. His hopes rest on an experimental pilot training program developed by NASA that could help solve the growing problem in the cockpit. It's known as Cockpit Resource Management, or CRM. It's a system of training designed to improve the way pilots communicate. It helps to improve crew coordination and improve collective decision making on the cockpit. And the way it does that is it teaches captains to listen better, and it teaches the other members of the flight deck to be respectfully assertive. In a move that will have a lasting impact on airline safety, the Federal Aviation Administration adopts DEAL's CRM recommendation. From here on, the job of flying a commercial airliner will never be the same. United Airlines is one of the first to implement a CRM training program for its pilots. 
it's still in use today. United's Director of Flight Training Operations is Mark Champion. The principles of crew resource management are that no one individual in the cockpit can possibly understand or see all of the threats that are out there. It requires the entire crew to really foresee and manage the various threats that happen to be in play when an airplane is in flight. Today, United pilot Sherry Rutledge I'm having a hard time maintaining my speed here. He's undergoing CRM training. I got the airplane. In this simulation, she and her captain are dealing with an emergency. Engine oil low pressure. If oil pressure is less than 60 psi. A mechanical problem has forced a shutdown of one of their two engines. Engine one shutdown. Engine mode selector to ignition. It's designed to mimic the situations that I will see in actual airplane flying? Uh, yes. Oakland Center, United, uh, 1916. We're declaring an emergency. We've had an engine failure at altitude. There are specific threats that we have to deal with as a crew, be able to communicate, plan, decision make, through to a safe outcome. So it's a problem-solving uh, type of scenario, and you're very focused. It doesn't look to me as though we've got a fire issue, though. We've shut it down quickly enough. All the flight crew comes together, agrees on, yes, this is the way uh, everything's appropriate, and then you go to the next step. Yeah, pull the book out okay. and take a look at that. It's very easy sometimes to know what your intention is and think that the people around you will also know what that intention is, uh, but that's not usually the case. And I'm going to go off and talk to dispatch to maintain flying the airplane. How are we doing on altitude? They keep each other informed every step of the way, exactly as the exercise intends. As well, I wanted to, ladies and gentlemen, your captain speaking. We're now in our decent uh, M2 San Francisco. The CRM training makes every difference in every flight. It has empowered me as a crew member and reminded me to speak up, We're getting a little close in here. Uh, to help with decisions, to maintain my situation awareness, and that, I think, is the most important part of it. In the States, we've literally gone a decade without losing a single passenger at a major carrier uh, accident. Many of the experts concluded that that was at least partly due to CRM. Had the crew of Flight 173 received such training? Figure about another 15 minutes. They might have expressed their concerns more forcefully, insisting Captain McBroom land immediately. Not enough. 15 minutes is really going to run us low on fuel here. Instead, they expected their captain to make okay. the right decision. OK, declare Mayday. Malburn McBroom was held responsible for the crash. He retired shortly afterwards. Flight 173 passenger Amy Connor met Captain McBroom in 1998, six years before his death. Um, the man that I saw at the reunion was very broken, very broken, and yet so willing to be there for us under whatever circumstances there were. Call him ramp. Give my passenger count. If I had had any anger toward him before the reunion, I sure didn't after I met him. I know that he truly believed he had more fuel on board than he did have. Tell him to pass that on to the fire department. I always said that pilot air is not an answer. It's only a symptom of some underlying problems. The thing to remember is don't worry. McBroom was flying under the cockpit culture of the time. This was an accident waiting to happen. They were a product of their times, and we have to judge those men by uh, the environment they operated in. He don't do that sort of thing on purpose. We can't make it. He was devastated he lost his license. He lost his family. The rest of his life was just shattered. 